Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. We've got a lot of, I guess you could say, communications, questions, or otherwise, about, in quotes, women's health, women's health. But the, the focus on women's health came almost dominantly in the area of heart disease cardiology. Sitting in front of me, in front of me, is Lana Lee Sam, Dr. Lana Lee Sam, and uh, she's with Elite OBGYN, but she's minimally invasive surgical expert. So welcome. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, as you said, most of our questions are on women's health. Well, you know, we're more than 50% of the population. And an old friend. Uh, not old by age, but an old friend by, by relationship. Uh, Molly Ann Zechariah, very well-known cardiologist in our community. Uh, great reputation, great knowledge. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Zechariah. Welcome to our show. It's my privilege and an honor to be here. Thank you. And you're both uh, affiliated with uh, the you know, Broward Health System, and you're at uh, Imperial Point Hospital, I think, both of you? Yes. Yeah. Right. There are three issues that, I mean, all the years that we've been doing the show, uh, we, we look very carefully, and we talk about a lot of things, but the three issues are cardiology, cancer, and now it's minimally invasive surgical techniques. So we're going to cover two areas here today. So to, let's talk about cardiology, Dr. Zachariah. I know what you do, but tell the folks uh, what your area of expertise is. I am practically a clinical cardiologist, uh, by which it means that I take care of patients and do some non-invasive testing and categorize people for their risk and treat accordingly. Um, so I am with the patient all the time and my job doesn't involve any procedures other than testing, some of the testing. I'm very interested in the preventative health in women because so much has been accomplished in this country over the last 40 years and the overall mortality from heart disease in women have decreased considerably. Nevertheless, heart disease is the number one cause for death and all kind of mortality for uh, women. It is the number one cause of death. In spite of the cancer, everything is important, but this seems to be something that has to be given uh, very much attention and it's being given federally and by American College of Cardiology, as well as American Heart Association, and other small groups and people like me who are practicing physicians. So let me introduce Dr. Lana Lee Sam, Dr. Sam. Uh, pleasure to be here and to add on to, I was quite involved with the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women movement and, and completely cognizant of the number one killer in this country is heart disease. I was laughing to myself as we talked about how time has transitioned and now that women are driving and going and in the workplace and juggling so much, the stress is, has increased and I think that that is probably significant to uh, the heart disease and the issues that you're seeing. Now, before I say anything about minimally invasive, I've got to take advantage of the fact that you're here to say the cardiology screening. When I see women and they come in, we generally are saying that over 50, they need to go get screened. Is that, uh, is that the standard? Actually, the standard is right now, a woman who is 20 years of age with mm -hmm. no risk factor should have three to five year interval risk stratification. As you get older, the risks may be different. As, and people with heart disease in the family or risk factors have to be screened more often. They're actually the symptoms of heart disease in men and women and risk factors could be, most of it is the same, but the 
menarche, the time of menopause, and surgical or natural ophorectomy, mm -hmm. all this makes women have a separate degree of risk factors, which if you diagnose and at attend and make it aware to the public and to your patient, a lot of the cardiovascular outcomes can be modified, postponed, and can be uh, treated much earlier than death or heart attack occurs. So the standard is, if you are 55 or above, everybody has to be screened for heart disease. Mm -hmm. If you have the right age, mm -hmm. family history of heart disease, or personal history of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and the amount of cholesterol, high cholesterol, and if you smoke, and complication related to pregnancy, makes them at a much higher risk for uh, heart disease. I'm always so excited to be have a chance to talk with my colleagues. Right. We all get in our little boxes, mm -hmm. and the opportunity to learn is phenomenal. Surgery is the last option that we want to uh, want to undergo. I've been doing surgery for over 20 years now. I'm older than I look. And I didn't say you looked old. <laughs> you were looking skeptical. <laughs> no, no, I didn't All say right. that. I'm um, doing surgery for over 20 years, and what it what it has taught me is to respect surgery, which means that I'm always going to look for an option uh, to avoid that. And if we have to move to surgery, which is a definitive way to cure something, to be engaged in it in a minimally invasive fashion. And you alluded to the fact that. OB-GYN has gone through incredible changes and incredible technology that is exponential along with the rest of the exponential industries going on. So we've gone from being able to do a hysterectomy, which is removing the uterus and is the most common surgery at over 700,000 hysterectomies done for various reasons in this country. And that typically used to be a, a big incision. We went from that to laparoscopy, which is being able to do it with um, keyhole surgery, mm -hmm. with trocars, to then moving to robotic assisted laparoscopy, which allowed us to do even more complicated cases in a minimally invasive fashion. And now we're at the point, and I'm so proud of Imperial for having purchased the equipment, which is a DaVinci XI robotic machine, to allow us or allow me to do robotic assisted single incision laparoscopic hysterectomies, which means that when I do a hysterectomy, I make an incision this big through their belly button, do everything through the belly button, and my patient goes home the same day. And we live in South Florida, so they're back in a bikini in two to three weeks. Well, that's why, you know, again, the, the folks who talk to us about minimally invasive surgical mm -hmm. techniques, uh, surgery portends in a lot of the viewers' minds cutting, mm -hmm. blood, and pain. And the minimally invasive techniques that are changing because you just went through almost history. almost 15 years or maybe two decades mm -hmm. of minimally invasive i guess you could say techniques uh has uh, eliminated a good amount of cutting mm -hmm. blood and pain correct absolutely so when i'm talking to my patients about minimally invasive surgery everybody likes to see a very clear example, which is I can say, would you rather have my big giant thick hands and fingers tearing a hole in your belly, or would you prefer to have something the size of a pencil tip that has HD definition, 3D, 4D manipulation that controls for tremor that I'm controlling do your surgery. So generally in hysterectomies, uh, abdominal hysterectomies, it's a large incision. It's a two to three day stay in the hospital, significant pain, and a six to eight week recovery. I, 
I like to always think about these things as a practical example that yesterday I performed a surgery at Imperial Point, a robotic single incision, total laparoscopic hysterectomy on a young 46 year old. And that patient, we did the surgery at 8.20 in the morning. I completed it by 9.30, so it takes about an hour. And then that patient went home at 6.30 p.m. And I checked with that patient this morning and doing absolutely great. And even the, the part that excites me so much is I've been doing single incision hysterectomies for two and a half years, since 2014 and although I've been doing robotics for 10 years, this single incision, this next progression, I've had a patients now that come back for their annual visit. And I'll tell a slightly embarrassing story, which is the patient came back for their annual visit and I'm busy. So I didn't look at the chart and I walked in to see this patient and the patient is, and I'm like, hi, I recognize them and I'm doing their checkup. And I do their pap smear and realize that they don't have a cervix. And I'm going, okay, you know, well, what was the reason for the hysterectomy? And she goes, well, you should know, Dr. Sam, you know, you did it a year and a half ago. So I go, oh, yeah, 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 of course, it was fibroids, I remember. And, I, and then I go to do her physical exam. And I'm looking, and I can't find an incision. But I'm the surgeon that did this surgery. Mm -hmm. So I get skeptical of myself. I play it off, and I'm like, so when was our hysterectomy? And she goes, she tells me. And I actually walk out of the room, go back to my computer, and I pull up the operative report and I pull up the pathology because I couldn't find my own incision. And that was the day that I thought, all right, this is amazing technology. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. It's wonderful. And Dr. Zachariah, I know that uh, you're not involved in the surgical end of it, but let's talk about uh, cardiac care. I mean, you know, uh, the the days, not that it isn't necessary, because it's still we need the, uh, cardiolo the cardi cardiology thoracic surgical techniques available at all times, but you know, uh, open heart surgery has diminished dramatically because of the utilization of stents and the technology in the, in the placement of these things. So let's talk a bit about uh, interventional cardiology. I know that you see the patient before and after, but let's talk a bit about that. Okay. Um, it has become much easier uh, to treat and make decisions now because of the evidence-based guidelines established. So uh, if you follow the guidelines as per what's recommended for the age group, just like when she's going to have a surgery, if she sees an abnormal cardiogram, there is guidelines how to deal with that. With that guideline-based therapy, which includes aggressive medical treatment for people who are high risk for future myocardial infarction. And once these people have testing which is appropriately aimed. Actually, they categorize into mild, intermediate, and severe risk. The intermediate risk is the one that most people can miss. The high risk, there should not be any question. They proceed for interventional procedures, including cardiac catheterization or um, CT coronary angiography, which usually is reserved for intermediate risk patients. With the cardiac catheterization, they're able to open up lesions which are appropriate right there and then with excellent result. So if done by the right person for the right indication in the right artery, they are much better off than bypass surgery. So the morbidity being in the hospital, and thinking of having an open heart surgery, which some people need. Even open heart surgery done by a good surgeon, people live long time before they have the second surgery or intervention. Uh, I see my family, my husband and my brother-in-law both did, do interventional part of it. But even the interventional procedures have come 
much lesser than before because of the aggressive treatment early in life. Mm -hmm. You can regress the blockage in some patients if appropriately treated. So interventional cardiology is absolutely saving life, morbidity and problems related to surgery, and even more, appropriate medication given at the right time early enough can even postpone intervention. Yeah, you know, uh, sitting in that chair where you're sitting, Dr. Sam, uh, a very well-known interventional cardiologist that you know very well, <laughs> was sitting right there and we were talking just about that. And he said, nutrition, mm -hmm. exercise, lifestyle. I am such a believer and there's a, there's a picture that I actually have on most of my practice, on my practice materials that talks about the six best doctors in the world are nutrition, you know, sleep, exercise, breathing, and, and sort of those components. All of us, we love what we do and, and that's why we went into this field. But what I love to see is people who aren't sick. And the preventive aspect, the ability to engage in small behavioral changes that incrementally prevent heart attacks, prevent strokes, prevent diabetes, prevent hypertension, that's phenomenal. You know, some of the things that I'm, that are what I deal with are, are largely, we don't know how to prevent them. We don't know how to prevent fibroids in women. And it's not anything you did or anything you can do. Uh, we, don't, we do know that endometrial hyperplasia, which is precancer cells in the uterus, are tied to obesity. So again, exercise, weight loss, incremental changes, drinking water, it's phenomenal. If, if you ever get a chance to interview a gentleman by the name of Dr. Nick Hall, who is a PhD? Did you do you know him? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have a I have an absolute crush on Dr. Nick Hall. I'll let him know next time I see him. Please tell him I know he's in he's in this area. Mm -hmm. So I have been nonstop recommending his his books and his concepts of I know what to do and I still don't do it. And he talks about why so many of us, we know what to do. And I actually, another thing that I do in my practice and in my life and in my office is I have signs that say, do no harm. Mm -hmm. But it's do no harm to the patients, right. but do no harm to yourself. So I was harassing my staff about the fact that they would go to lunch and come back with bags of Burger King and this, that, and the other. And I said, I want you to look at that sign. And every time you go to reach for that option, I want you to think, do no harm. Am I doing no harm to myself? And it's those three words, if you implant them in your head, they really, they start, they start to change and you start to think. It hits, it hits me all the time. I'm like, oh, I really do want that double latte with some extra espresso and maybe two sugars, but do no harm to myself. You know, uh, it's interesting because I, I, I didn't miss that, the, the, that in the discussion with the, the doctor that was sitting in that chair. He overwhelmingly, he, twice, three times, he said sleep. Mm -hmm. You have to have sleep. And he said not, you know, he's talking about continuous sleep because it is so necessary for body health. The the thing that I want to get into, is, and we have a lot of uh, of of women that watch us, obviously a lot of men that watch us, but they, I always tell them because we, we have a tremendous audience of people that are what I call the mature, mm -hmm. uh, over the age of 65. We have a, the largest group of people in the United States, percentage-wise, of the people over the age of 70. We have a, the largest group of people over the age of 80 of any state in the union. And they only they want quality of life. Mm -hmm. Now these are the survivors. They've survived to this point, but they they want quality of life. And really, uh, we try to advocate through you, mm -hmm. through both of you, and your comments today, 
that they must visit their physicians. They must communicate with their physicians. Don't make the physician Guess. sit there <laughs> and ask questions which you have the answers to before the physician almost asks you. Come in with your list of how many over-the-counter preparations you take, what kind of nutrients or vitamins or nutraceuticals you take. Don't hide anything. Tell them. Uh, you know, the, the minor little things like, oh, gee, you know, my, my hand got numb for about an hour or so, or I tripped on, uh, on what I thought was a threshold, but I just tripped. M minor things that are so helpful. Am I correct, Dr. Zachariah? You're right, sir. Right? Yes. And I, I, you know, it reminds me, and I keep on, I, I plead with the audience, please take good care of yourself which means exactly what you just said. Yep. Uh, I, and you talk about obesity. I mean, uh, I, even though it's not part of, I, I guess, the original concept of this program, but obesity is so, it's, it's, it's endemic mm -hmm. in this nation. Uh, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with, you said stress before, a lot of it has to do with, gee, I have to eat something and I have to eat it quickly or whatever, or I have to gulp down a protein drink, or I'll eat in the car on the way to work. But what we don't realize is the number of calories that we're placing into our bodies. So it's all yours. I'm that was, um, so I, I tend to read a lot, and I, and I often write prescriptions to my patients, which are recommending three books I need them to read immediately. And one of the books that I, I've been, aside from Nick Hall's, was a book called Spartan Up by the gentleman who created the Spartan Races. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, again, the sort of obesity and that even though we started making governmental decree that every fast food should list how many calories it is. You know, it's 1,200 calories, it's 800 calories, it's 600. But calories don't mean anything. And his suggestion, which I thought was amazing, was maybe what they need to list is the number of burpees or push-ups or sit-ups that each of these represent. And that gives you a better idea that, okay, if I eat this one uh, super size French fry, that's 150 push-ups. I'm, I'm making, making a, a guesstimate there. And it, it is, it's incredibly difficult because we're being pummeled with media that tells us, eat, 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 eat. This is delicious, this is wonderful, this is this. And one burger, and that's your caloric extreme for the entire day. So it's very difficult. I, I've struggled myself, but the one point after my son was born, though it'll never be documented everywhere, anywhere, I'm, because I refuse to be weighed, I'm pretty sure I was well over 200 and change pounds, and it's, it was only by struggling to get back into, into activities that I got it down. Well, you're, you're, you should be proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. I am, and again, it's that do no harm. Every mm -hmm. morning, I, I'm usually up at 5.30, I swim every morning because I love swimming. That's good. Dr. Zachariah. We're, we're, we're getting down to the end of this show, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to tell these viewers uh, about their responsibility to see their physicians and how often they should see their physicians. I'm not just talking about the cardiac. Uh -huh. I'm talking about uh -huh. general public. How often should they see their physicians? Actually, at the age of 20 on, even if you have no risk factors, every three to four years. And depending upon your lifestyle, if you exercise regularly and are maintaining a good lifestyle, that can be extended. Whereas people with family history of problems and personal history of problems have to be seen periodically, sometimes six months or one year. And it's equal responsibility for a physician to spend valuable personal time with patient to make them aware what's available to make their lives better. And simple exercise for 60 minutes a day can give them a whole lot of help than all medications combined. Well, you, you hit it. Uh, we're down to the last minute of this show. And, I, and in the essence 
of why we had this show about women's health is, is encompassed in the last statement. Both of you are accomplished physicians that are advocates for wellness and prevention. You would like not to see as many patients as you see with the problems they present, but it, there is a reality. Uh, you have a group of individuals that have had, they have not had the advice and consent. And consent is very important because you must, uh, the physician must make the patient aware of the fact that this is what should happen and this is what I agree with the, you, the patient. So I appreciate both of you being here. Dr. Uh, Zachariah, Dr. Molly Ann Zachariah, I've known you for a long time. It's an honor and privilege to have you here. You're a great advocate uh, for wellness and prevention and certainly in the field of cardiology, everyone knows of you. So thank you very much for being here. It's my privilege. Thank you. And to my new friend, Lana Lee Sam, who uh, I found out that uh, Lana Lee, uh, how you got your name and I told you how I got my name. So we have something in common. Uh, but I, I want you to know that we're very pleased to have you here. And I think the people of Broward County in this area should be very happy that you're uh, with Elite G, uh, uh, OBGYN and you're a minimally invasive surgical, uh, I guess you could say, expert. How about that? Indeed. How about that? And we appreciate your advocacy in behalf of wellness and prevention, but more importantly, on outcomes that make these people uh, have a uh, quality of life which is what they really are begging for. The people who watch the show often tell us it's the quality of life issues that are most important to them. So thank you both for being here. Folks, I hope we uh, gave you some good information uh, to think about. Uh, and again, I always tell you, you got to take good care of yourself, which means communication. These people have their open minds. They're willing to, to listen to you. Please tell your doctors what's going on. And um, remember, uh, this show is your show. So if you have any questions, you want some answers, there's a telephone number and an email address right here. And uh, we are here as spokespeople for you. So if you have any ideas about shows, let's let us know. This show is called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. My name is Fred Lipman. Until next time, see ya.